Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Human Transit Revisiting, How Queer Thinking About Public Transit Can Enrich Communities and Lives, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in partnership with the Smart Growth Network and Island Press. My name is Jill Lemke, and I serve as Manager of Planning and Engagement at the Maryland Department of Planning. I also serve as a member of the Smart Growth Network Steering Committee. The Smart Growth Network is a national alliance of advocates, practitioners, policymakers, and local leaders working towards a shared vision for land use and infrastructure policies and actions that result in healthy, sustainable, equitable, and prosperous communities for all. In addition to hosting webinars, we provide information on effective planning, development, and preservation practices. The Smart Growth Network website is currently undergoing a transition, so please stay tuned for updates. Today's webinar is one of a series of webinars hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning related topics. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted along with past webinars for viewing via the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov or by visiting our YouTube channel. The planning department's website also provides valuable information on statewide planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities, and includes links to past and future webinars. We encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter to learn more about our upcoming programs. It is important to note that the views expressed by the speaker are those of the speaker and not necessarily those of the Maryland Department of Planning, the State of Maryland, or the Smart Growth Network. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association. To receive your credits, visit the APA's website, planning.org, to log into your account and search for the name of today's event. You can also search for event number 9286658. Following the presentation, we will address as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question at any time by open, opening the Q&A tool in the Zoom panel um, on your screen. I am pleased to introduce our speaker for today. Jarrett Walker is a recognized transportation expert who has been designing public transit systems for over 20 years. He is an independent consultant in North America and principal consultant with MR Cagney in Australia. He writes the popular transit blog, humantransit.org. Welcome to our webinar series, Jarrett, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jill. It's really great to be here, and I really look forward to having a great conversation with you all. I was going to start if uh, with a quick presentation. I'll talk for maybe um, half an hour at most, just hitting some of the key points of the new edition and um, <clears throat> a little bit about, about um, why this book is quite a bit different from the original version of Human Transit that came out in 2011. Um, first of all, just a little bit about who we are. Um, we have a, I have a consulting firm here in North America called Jarrett Walker and Associates, um, where our message is that we foster clear conversations about public transit leading to confident decisions. So one of the most important things about us is that we're trying to help communities figure out how to meet their goals with public transit, not necessarily coming in with our goals. But that's very important because public transit requires us to think about goals very clearly and carefully. And that's one of the things you'll see me doing all the way through the book is, um, is, is helping to clarify what are the goals, where are goals coming into conflict, and how do we have clear conversations about that. We're known particularly for our network plans. Uh, we've done many redesigns of bus networks, um, both across North America and overseas, um, in, um, and we are, um, we're very proud of that track record, but we're also providing all kinds of other expert advice around network design policy. Um, now, again, the most important sentence in the whole book, my job in this book is not to make you share my values, but to give you the tools to clarify and advocate yours. That's the whole point. Um, I want 
you to be able to go where you want to go with public transit. But to do that, you do need to understand some of the basic geometry underlying how public transit works so that you can see the choices that you have and the opportunities that it presents. Um, <clears throat> the main topics of the book, and, um, and this is consistent with, with the first edition, they, we talk through public transit's role, how to talk about what is the thing that only public transit can do. Um, we talk about understanding the geometry of public transit. So there are chapters on um, the line, on frequency, on speed and reliability, um, on walking, on all of the key elements that go into making any public transit service. Then seeing the real choices that we must think about. Many of you are probably familiar with the trade-off between ridership and coverage goals, which goes back to a, a scholarly paper I wrote in 2008 um, and is a thing that an issue that continues to be at the center of all of the plans we do because it's an unavoidable trade-off. Um, and then finally, consequences for land use and location choice. All of this has been heightened, I would say, in the new edition. Um, the new edition ha uh, has much more pushback on the various kinds of technology hype that we've heard around public transit. The ver we've all heard um, highly credentialed and respected people out of Silicon Valley saying that in various ways that public transit is obsolete or in need of disruption. And much of the, there are grains of truth in that. And then there's also a great deal of nonsense and quite a bit of energy goes into sorting that out in the new edition. There's an important new chapter on planning for diversity. This chapter was inspired by an instructive outburst by Elon Musk. Uh, the chapter is called A Bunch of Random Strangers in which we challenge elite projection and in particular challenge what I call the choice rider fallacy. I'll talk about that more in this presentation a little later. And then there's an expanded discussion of location choice about why things are where they are. And that too will be um, discussed in, uh, I'll talk about that too in a few moments in the presentation. But the, but the most interesting single change, I think, is that right at the nucleus of the book, at the foundation of the whole argument, I've restructured and clarified the way I talk about freedom and, to t and, and emphasizing increasingly the need to talk about freedom, not just as an abstract feel-good word that makes, us, that makes us feel a certain way, but as a thing we can actually measure. And that if we put it at the center of how we do transit planning would lead us to having substantially better transit systems. Um, this is not just an abstract belief in mind, but, uh, mind, but it's something that we've implemented through our consulting practice, particularly in the last five years or so, where we've built all of our uh, network design work around this kind of analysis that I'm about to show you. So the idea of this analysis is a thing called the wall around your life. So... Here's a person. She's in a city full of possible destinations, places she could shop, places she could study, um, 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 people she could meet, all kinds of things she could do. In the transit system as it is, there's an area she can get to in an amount of time she's likely to have in her day. And her access to destinations is simply the number of useful destinations in that area that she can get to. We're trying to quantify the fact that people just don't make trips to places that are too hard to get to, and that makes their lives poorer in all kinds of measurable ways. So this is why I call it the wall around your life. It's a little bit like the wall of a prison in that travel time limits what you can do to make various kinds of trips. Now, the first thing that may come to mind is, of course, there are actually several different concentric walls that represent different kinds of travel time budgets for different kinds of situations. That's true. We use 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes to represent kinds of trips that you might want to make every day, like a trip to work or to school. There's a shorter travel time budget for errand trips like to groceries. There's a longer travel time budget for a trip you make much less often like a vacation. But the core of the idea, which is that we have only so much time and that we can visualize that limitation on our time as a wall and that we can then talk about transport planning 
moving that wall outward, as well as, by the way, good land use planning, putting more good stuff inside the wall we already have. That's the fundamental image. So here's how this plays out in an actual study. We used this uh, tool in when we did the network redesign in Dublin, Ireland, and we provided the public actually with a tool where they could point to absolutely any location in the city, and they would see these blobs showing how the network changes where they can go. So for example, if a person was located at Dundrum in the south of Dublin, there's there, um, and, and uh, we would then, and let me quickly show you the, a bit of the hint of the network change. This was a network of mostly infrequent and very complicated tangled services being in general replaced by a simpler network of much more frequent straighter lines. Um, quite a bit more has happened with the Dublin network plan since we drew these maps, but that gives you a general idea of it. And so we were able to show, here's, the, here's where someone in Dundrum can get to in the existing network in 45 minutes. Here's where, where they could get to in the proposed network, and here's the difference. And we could quantify that Jane could get to 25% more jobs or student enrollments, and I want to say that on some fundamental level, that means that she is 25% more free. She has that many more options in her life. Um, that's the fundamental idea. We, could, we then took this up to the citywide level. So if this is the result for this particular location, Dundrum, then we color each location according to how much access expands at that location. And you get this kind of map showing how expanded access is distributed across the city. And people who know Dublin know that the brown areas that have lost access are mostly areas where there aren't many people and the green areas are areas where there are quite a lot of people. But that brought us to this headline soundbite. The average Dubliner can get to 16% more destinations in 45 minutes. 20% um, more destinations in 30 minutes. The average Dubliner can just go more places, do more things, and thus have more opportunities in their lives. It's a very powerful idea. Now, the remarkable thing about this is that although it, it, it has an immediate kind of rhetorical power when you put it in the language of freedom, it's also a pretty good measure of the economic functionality of the city. Because the whole point of a city is to bring people together with jobs and opportunities. That's why we live in cities. That's why we have cities. Um, the, um, it's also turning out to be a reasonably good proxy for ridership in that if we expand access, we find pretty reliably that we're expanding ridership. And if you stop and think about it, it's pretty obvious why that's the case. When we are expanding access, we are improving the odds that when a person looks up a trip they want to make, they will find that the travel time is reasonable. And that is the first step toward making that a transit trip. And if the travel time is not reasonable, nothing else about transit matters. Travel time has to be reasonable. It has to fit into people's lives for transit to even be an option. So, um, and the other great thing about access, of course, is that we can use it to analyze both transportation and land use decisions. Transportation planning is about moving the walls outward. Good land use planning is about putting more stuff inside the wall you already have. Both of those things are expansions of your freedom and expansions of ridership potential. So um, access really helps us go back to this burning question that everyone was talking about 10 or 20 years ago, and really for most of my career which is that for most of my career, when I, have, uh, when I have been at an event and somebody asks me what I do and I say I'm a transit planner, their next question has almost always been, what do you think of this particular transit technology? And for much of my career, the media conversation about transit has been very much about, should we buy this technology? Is this technology a good thing in the abstract? Light rail or streetcars or, or, or um, bus rapid transit or monorails or whatever. And access doesn't care about this question at all. There are features of a technology that do have an effect on access, but there are a lot of common features of a technology that don't have an effect on access at all. 
most obviously, for example, a streetcar operating in mixed traffic and a bus operating in mixed traffic are going to have very similar speed and reliability, and it's not going to make any difference to the access outcome. Um, it will make a difference to the access outcome if the streetcar line is very short and therefore you uh, have to transfer more times, for example, than the bus line requires. There are all sorts of indirect ways that they may have an impact. But fundamentally, thinking about where you can go is an invitation to think less about your emotional reactions to transit technologies. And I think that's a good thing because planning transit networks around our emotional attachment to technologies has not always led us to very durable and effective investments. What Access cares about instead is the pattern of the network and the relationship of the network to the built environment. That's all Access Analysis cares about. It fundamentally starts with the assumption that even more than you like riding trains rather than buses, you like getting where you're going so that you can go on and have and continue with your life. And that turns out to be a pretty effective and successful insight for understanding how people are actually making decisions. Now, um, 20 years ago or so, when the streetcar revival movement was at its height in the US, one of the things that the proponents of that movement were um, uh, emphasizing repeatedly is the notion that we need to build rail transit, not um, because it helps you get anywhere sooner, but because it sends a signal to the real estate market that this investment is permanent. And one of the things I, I think we can say now is that's not really true. It wasn't really, it was, it was sort of an obviously self-contradictory argument at the time, since the 1900 era streetcars are mostly gone, which means that rail transit wasn't obviously permanent. Um, the true test of permanence lies in the operating budget of the service, which requires permanent political support. This is a very understandable mistake. If you're coming from architecture, if you're coming from the architecture world and used to thinking about buildings and physical infrastructure, or if you're coming from general infrastructure engineering, you're used to thinking about things whose cost lies primarily in the cost of building them. And it's easy to bring that attitude into public transit without stopping to, to correct the absolutely overwhelming difference, which is that transit cost is first and foremost operating cost. And if a capital investment doesn't make the operations efficient, it's going to be very expensive in the long run because capital is, um, construction cost is once, but operations are forever. So one of the challenges I think we're going to have with some of the streetcars that were built during the streetcar revival movement is that um, they need, they now have operating budgets which are sitting inside of city budgets competing with other priorities. And it may not always be the case that these services win that battle uh, for operating funding, which they have to win every year forever, particularly where the, in the cases where these services have turned out to be designed in a way that makes them just not all that useful. Make, in other words, and I can say this more precisely, that these services, some of these services have been designed in a way that caused them to just not contribute that much to access. So, um, the thing to remember is that because transit cost is dominated by operating cost, true permanence lies in high ridership. A high ridership bus line is permanent because it's because there's a permanence lying in the land use pattern along that bus line that generates that demand. I'm, I am much more confident in the permanence of numerous bus lines in the United States than I am in the permanence of numerous rail segments precisely because I am always focused on how to fund the operating cost and whether the political consensus will always be there to support the eternal operating budget. So it raises the question, what if our concept of transit-oriented development were not so much about building nice buildings around charismatic rail infrastructure, but instead, we're about following transit access. Well, you would still follow useful rail infrastructure. You would certainly uh, cluster high density around rail transit stations where the rail provides great access. But you wouldn't necessarily cluster high density development around a slow streetcar, which doesn't provide much more access than a bus does. And meanwhile, 
you'd be very aggressive about encouraging density along the frequent bus network, as many cities already do. Portland, Oregon has had a frequent network defined in policy for a long time. It looks like, uh, it looks like this. Um, a whole bunch of land use policies are tied to being on the frequent bus network. And as a result, density happens along the frequent bus network in this sort of look. Um, we're tending to build four over ones um, all along these major corridors now where we have the demand in response to our housing emergency. And that's how it's done. It doesn't have to be rail. What it does have to be is high access service measured in the way I just talked about. Now, one of the reasons why these conversations have been so difficult and why it has been difficult to really focus on this is that there's been an alternate narrative about how transit planning works, which is that it requires thinking demographically about two different groups of people, a so-called choice rider and a so-called dependent or captive rider. And the image we are always supposed to have is that the choice rider is someone who has a car and likes using his car, and I'm supposed to provide a service that will make him leave his car in the driveway. Whereas the dependent or captive rider does not have a car, has to use transit no matter how bad it is. And this actually goes back to some primitive modeling tools uh, that in the early days did not have the capability to make more subtle distinctions. But I want to convince you that this distinction is nonsense and that we should stop thinking this way. The reality is that almost everybody is in the middle in some way. <clears throat> Most of us have some incentive and some disincentive to driving. Many of us have cars, but our cars are old or unreliable, or like me, we have cars, but we just hate driving because we can't get out of our heads how dangerous it is. So we look for alternatives when we can. Um, lots of people, too, are in financial situations where the car is to some degree a burden. We can, for example, help people own fewer cars, help people sell their car. But in the, in the binary model, that's nonsense. Nobody would consciously choose to be a captive rider, which is what that would mean, right? So this model just can't describe what actually happens all the time in our cities with car ownership. It's even more complicated now, of course, because we have Lyft and Uber, which are making it easier to not own a car, but to rely on Lyft and Uber occasionally for the kind of trip that you can't make on transit. All of these things mean that what we need to care about is the middle 80 to 90% of the population and not so much the top 10% of the population who have really nice cars and who like driving them everywhere. And that middle 80 to 90%, everyone's in a slightly different situation, but most people have some incentive and some disincentive to driving. And that's why a small improvement in a network, and all the network designs I've done in my career are proof of this. When we make a small improvement in a bus line, when we improve a frequency or something like that, we usually get a measurable ridership payoff that's tied to the fact that access is now better. And if, every, if everyone were in one of those two boxes, that wouldn't be possible. This is a bad model and it needs to go away because it's not helping us think clearly about how we actually improve public transit. Finally, I want to end with just a couple of words about location choice. Um, my language about location choice is much stronger than it was in the first edition. Location choice creates the whole problem that we expect transport systems, including public transit, to solve. As people berate transit authorities for failing to solve their problems, they should remember who chose to make that problem easier or harder by choosing where some important destination would be and how it would be laid out. We really have to engage land use planners and developers in the conversation about transit in a way that requires ask, calling on them to take responsibility for many of the choices they've made about where things are. I just had a conversation uh, in, a, in a city that, that one of many cities that I'm working in where I was told, well, we have to run transit service to this hospital that's way, way outside of the city because that's where everyone gets referred to to see specialists. And I ask, well, why are the specialists all out at that hospital way outside the city? 
And the answer was because that's near where they live, right? They're all millionaires. They all have nice estates out in that part of the world and they don't want to come into the city. So, you know, everyone else who needs to see them has to go out to them. How did it end up that way? How did we end up making location choices that way that create these enormous transportation problems that we then yell at transit agencies for solving? Um, we really need to talk more about that. So one of the things I do in the book is lay out the really simple recipe for a transit-oriented place, for how to recognize when you're thinking about locating something, a home, a business, but especially something that someone else will need to go to, you need to, uh, these are the very things that we as transit planners look for, um, uh, look for in a development in order or in a particular land use pattern to know whether we are, um, um, to know whether we have a good ridership prospect or not. And those are density, walkability, linearity, and compactness. Just quickly to step through them, and then I'll wrap up. Um, density, of course, is simply how many people are around every transit stop. If they're in the upper image here, there are just twice as many people around every stop. So of course, twice as many people potentially using service. Um, walkability. Is it possible, in, on the left here, what you have is a dot in the center, which represents a stop and a, and a circle around it, which represents an abstract quarter mile from the stop. And the black lines are the segments of street where you can actually walk to the stop in a quarter mile. The point being, it depends enormously on the connectivity of the local street network. It also depends on whether it is safe to cross the street at a stop, really fundamental. Um, Compactness, do we have to cross long low ridership gaps? I was working recently with an agency that was showing me their long range plans for sprawl outside of their city. And it featured a cluster of apartment houses spaced about once a mile out across the prairie with low density in between them. So high density places that we would need to go to, but so far apart that we would have to cover enormous distance which means we can't offer good enough service. But finally, linearity. And linearity is in many ways the most important because of these four features. This is the one whose benefits are really unique to transit. And as a result, you can tell that a, a local government is not caring about transit because they don't care about linearity. In these two images, these four destinations that make up a community, in the upper image, they're all in a something that feels like a straight line which means that one transit line operating a minimum number of miles can feel like a direct service between all of them. In the lower image, which is more familiar to us as Americans, they're all back from the line. The office towers are on a cul-de-sac next to the freeway. The Walmart is behind a quarter mile of parking. The college is up on a hill at the end of a cul-de-sac road. The housing development is back into a cul-de-sac. Nothing is out on the straight path that transit can operate on. And as a result, transit is constantly deviating. And that's one of the basic things that we as transit planners can do nothing about once you've built your community that way. So in the new edition, I'm much more um, impatient about this. I talk about community college campuses and the problems of the standard community college campus design where you the main where the everything is as far as possible from the main main roads so that transit has to drive in and drive around in the parking lot in order to get to them. I talk about dense housing developments that have been oriented in ways that transit can never get to, such as this great example near River, Riverdale, Georgia, where there's a whole bunch of good development on this road that, that called Arrowhead Boulevard, which ends over here at a right in, right out intersection, which means transit can't do anything. I can't serve that with a fixed route um, because a right in, right out intersection would force me to drive in circles in a way that you're not going to want transit to do. And I am particularly outraged about this, although I've been dealing with it all my career, it becomes more and more, um, it, it becomes more and more infuriating every time I encounter it. Why are essential so social services being located where only motorists can reach them easily? I'm talking about the social security office. I'm talking about the child support office. I'm talking about the immigration office. I'm talking about all kinds of basic features that particularly disadvantaged people are likely to be able to get to.
So there's no, I don't mean to pick on Salinas, California, because almost all of the United States looks like this. Although I will give a shout out to Fort Bend, Indiana, or sorry, South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg's hometown, where the social security office is right next to the transit center downtown. I found that so astounding. I took a photograph of it because what I'm used to is this. So here's the south edge of Salinas, California. This is the municipal airport that's, that is, is just a private aviation airport, doesn't have commercial flights. So this is all industrial, very, very low density demand. And yet out here is the county government center, the social security administration, employment services, child support. So those are all must serve destinations. So we have to send the bus out here that drives through this labyrinth of transit hostile streets in order to get to these marooned uh, social service destinations. And because it's not serving anything else that has any market, it has it. We can't afford very much service on it. It only runs every 60 minutes. So it's not very useful service. You're still going to spend all afternoon making uh, 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 if you have to make an errand to those places. But there's nothing else we can do as long as the American habit continues to be that social services should be located in places where only motorists can get to them. Um, I'll just point out the opposite example in Australia, where I lived for a while. Most of these services are in a consolidated government office called Centrelink, and Centrelink offices are in shopping centers, which are almost always right next to transit centers in the centers of communities. They simply have not chosen to create this massive problem that consumes so much of our transit budgets, driving through these labyrinths to get to these marooned but must-serve destinations. So those are just a few thoughts to get us all going. And at this point, I want to thank you very much and welcome your questions and comments. Here's a little bit more about where and how to contact me. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Jared. That was really great. Interesting stuff. Um, we do have a lot of questions. I'm going to start with a couple of the pre-submitted questions. Um, Transit ridership depends heavily on remote work policies and is influenced by teleworking. Where do you see transit ridership going over the next five to 10 years? Um, where the nature of transit ridership is changing and not necessarily for the worse. What's happening is that Certainly many relatively high-end jobs, relatively high-end jobs, office jobs, have been replaced by telework, and some of that is permanent. And that's okay. That's happened at our company, too. Um, it's, it, it's, it, there's cert it's certainly even best, better for the environment if trips don't have to be made at all. But um, transit needs are still enormous. And to some extent, the reduction in the demand for peak rush hour commuting has enabled transit agencies to focus more fully on all of the rest of the market, which is everybody going everywhere all the time, all day, all weekend, all evening, for all kinds of purposes. Um, most North American transit agencies that I work for have been able to, to turn down the amount of rush hour express service that they operate that was very much focused on that briefcase commuter going in at nine, coming out at five. Um, it's on the one hand, you know, sad to have lost those riders and certainly commuter rail systems such as Mark, have a, uh, which, are much, which were much more structurally locked down to that market. Um, have a bigger transition to go through to become regional rail systems that serve more diverse markets. But that's the direction we have to go. The point is, there are plenty of other people that we can attract onto transit. And the thing about those rush hour services is that they were very expensive to operate. If you think about what's involved in running transit only at rush hour, it means that you have a bus or train that, you're, uh, that you have to own, even though you don't use it very much. It means you have a driver that uh, uh, an employee who has to report to work to work for only two or three hours. You're going to probably pay them a four hour minimum or more for that. That's expensive, those short shifts. And you have a vehicle that was usually full in one direction, but empty in the other direction. 
And because a, a driver's shift has to end where it began, we always had to account for the complete trip that got the driver and their vehicle back to where they started. So those services were never as, effect as efficient as they might have seemed to be to some of the people riding them in rush hour, in the rush hour direction. What transit agencies all over the country have been able to do is trade that service in now for just more robust, frequent service running all day, all directions, all the time. And in many cases, this has allowed for some pretty dramatic improvements in transit service in places where that's been funded, like here in Portland, Oregon, where I live, where we're doing a fairly substantial expansion of the transit system, not just recovery uh, to some sort of imagined pre-COVID state, but really planning for the network of the future, which is much more broadly focused on being useful to a huge diversity of people traveling all the time, all day, all evening, and all weekend. Good point. <laughs> um, can you discuss, a lot of people have questions about microtransit and um, how microtransit and on-demand transit um, models can support traditional transit. Can you discuss the re relationship between microtransit and local fixed route services? Sure, I will. Um, and actually, um, let me take the screen for a minute again, and I'll show you a piece of another presentation that I have that's, um, that's specifically about that. Um, uh, there we, oops, sorry. Hang on. Um, okay. Um, let me take the screen here for a moment. Oh. Okay. Pardon the quick pardon the quick delay. I do want to I do want to be able to address this because it's an important question that lots of people have asked about. Um, here we go. Um, are you seeing my screen, Chapter Two, fixed or flexible? Uh, with a lot of black space. Oh, I'm sorry. I've shared the wrong screen. Here we go. I'll try this again. We While go. we're waiting, I'll put in a plug for adding your questions into the question and answer box, and we will try to get to as many as possible. So you're seeing uh, what is flexible transit now? Yes. Good. So um, flexible transit, right, also called on-demand or microtransit, has lots of names. It's any service where the routing followed varies according to actual customer requests. So you know, somebody, somebody here, here in a zone wants to go to A and this person zone wants to go to B. And so microtransit in real time plots a path that picks them up and takes them where they're going. It's not an innovation. Um, uh, dial ride has, of course, existed for decades. What all that has been done under the microtransit brand is to add software that increases the responsiveness. So now these services are quite a bit um, more responsive and efficient, which means that whereas Dialride may have carried one or two people per hour of service, the flexible transit is carrying three or four people. There has, however, been an enormous amount of really unhelpful hype, mostly taking the tone of can Uber-like public transit replace old fashioned buses? The whole notion that this is something like Uber has caused enormous confusion because this is not like Uber. This is like dial -a ride has always been, except a little more efficient in ways that are useful. So, you know, we understand how a flexible transit zone works. You draw up a zone and people uh, within that zone can order the service to come to somewhere near them and take them typically to a rail station or to, some, or to somewhere else they're going inside the zone. There's a whole spectrum of what these things can actually be. So you can have a completely fixed route, which is what we have here on the left. You can have a fixed route with limited deviations on request where you just like, there's a little medical center. So there's just an optional deviation to that. You can also have a flex route with fixed or virtual, virtual stops, which is what we tend to recommend microtransit zones be, where if you live on this cul-de-sac and a cul-de-sac in this neighborhood, you have to walk out to the end of your cul-de-sac and the microtransit van will meet you there. 
And then there's the extreme of a door-to-door -door fully flexible zone, which is how demand, which is how um, paratransit for senior disabled people has always worked. Here's the thing to remember down at the bottom. The fixed route is the most direct. It is the most efficient precisely because you walk to it. And it is because you walk to it that the bus can keep going in a straight line and operates the minimum number of miles. The door-to-door -door fully flexible zone is the most circuitous, the most responsive, and therefore inevitably the most inefficient. Please remember, fixed transit is made efficient by walking. It is when people don't expect transit to come to their door and are willing to walk to transit, that transit can run in a straighter line that's likely to be a desire path for more people's trips. Remembering that operating cost is mostly labor, we're paying for an hour of the driver's time. It matters enormously when how much service we can devote to a big, intensive, frequent urban line with more, that can carry more than 50 boardings an hour as opposed to the sort of van that by virtue of having to make so many stops during an hour in different places is going to meander and will be lucky to carry five. Nothing about the, revel the, the software revolution around microtransit has changed that underlying math. And that is really important to remember. So there are places, there are many places where um, ridership potential is so low that the and the street network is so unsuited to fixed routes that microtransit is the least bad solution for providing transit to those places if you have decided to provide transit in those places mm -hmm. and we use microtransit frequently in exactly that way we uh, it appears in many of our plans but this has always happened in the context of a clear decision by the agency to provide coverage to those areas despite their low ridership potential. Other communities in similar situations have made, have made different decisions, have decided simply not to serve places that are not do not have high ridership potential. And this goes back why it all has to be discussed in the context of the fundamental trade-off between ridership goals and coverage goals. If you're maximizing your network for ridership, I'm sorry, but the mathematical fact is the way to do that is to not go everywhere, but to focus where you can where on the parts of your community where you're going to carry the most people. And if you are instead going to provide coverage, which is the opposite of ridership service, that is to say, service all across a community just so that people have access to it, that's great. That's nothing wrong with that. It's just the opposite of a ridership strategy because that's low ridership service and microtransit is one of the tools for doing that. Uh, and that's really where it fits. And that's the only place it fits. So by all means, use it, but don't fall for, but, but, but the, what, I, what I do strongly advise is if you are considering implementing microtransit so that it will make you look innovative, stop because that is a bad reason. <laughs> there are several good reasons to do microtransit in various situations, but the notion that we need to do this just so that we will seem to be up with the times is the worst possible reason and the cause, I think, of some of the worst implementations. Great, thank you. Um, a few people have asked a similar question about what what type of uh, density or a potential rule of thumb on the size of a city, whether it's size based on square miles or size based on population, that creates enough demand for public transit? And do you believe there is a minimum density that is needed to make fixed route mass transit viable? I resist this question <laughs> because um... Because again, it comes down to that ridership coverage trade-off. There are there may be good coverage reasons why a community chooses to provide public transit to everyone at any density. If your expectation of transit is ridership, then a degree of density and sort of critical mass of a city will do a lot to determine what kind of ridership you should expect. But I'm not going to say 
that there's a particular size of city that just shouldn't think about transit because every community has people who can't drive. Every community has people who um, really dislike driving. Every community has people who shouldn't be driving. People, for example, who've been convicted of DUIs who deserve to lose their license. But of course, in many communities, they won't lose their license because they'll plead to the judge that they wouldn't be able to get to work. And without transit, they may be right. And so they'll be back on the road threatening other people's lives. So there are lots of reasons to have a basic transit system at, in a community of almost any scale. However, when you start comparing yourselves to other cities, what I would say is compare yourselves to similar sized communities and look at what other communities have done. I think what I'd add one other particularly useful thing for US cities, which is that if you're thinking about what trans kind of transit is possible in your city, go to Canada and find the most similar Canadian city that's just about your size and that's similar in terms of economics. We're doing this wonderful natural experiment in North America where we have two different countries in basically a very similar landscape with a very similar economic and urban history. But Canada just spends a whole lot more on public transit, at least at least 50% more per capita all across the country, which means that even in a small town, you'll find a richer transit system that runs later in the evening, is more likely to run on Sundays, all kinds of things like that. So it's a good place to go to look for a peer for your community, wherever it is, and see what it might be like and what the benefits might be of just having some more tra public transit. That's a great point. I lived uh, along the Canadian border and my first transit experiences were in Toronto where I would mm -hmm. go and visit a friend and uh, we could take transit anywhere, but at home, that was not the case. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, another common theme is what can planners do to help transit succeed, especially in low, dan low density areas where single family um, housing is the primary housing type? So, think carefully about the configuration in that area of anything that's going to generate transit demand, by which I mean pods of apartments, medical facilities, or any substantial large-scale commercial development, something on the scale of a Walmart. Those will become must-serve transit destinations. Do not make us drive through long, long expanses of low density development to get to those places. Do not make us drive through labyrinths because you have put those places in particularly remote places inside of developments. Um, that is the most important thing you can do when you're planning an expanse of low density suburbia is to organize the inevitable high density uses and the commercial destinations, the medical and so on around a single corridor where transit will be possible so that we don't have to drive all over everywhere, but can run one efficient line with the minimum number of route miles that will actually get to where people need to go. Thank you. Another theme that I'm seeing, and um, it comes up a lot when you start talking about transit and um, there's sort of a stigma about transit in the United States. How do we overcome that cultural barrier? How do we overcome the perception or reality of, um, you know, the stigma of only certain people ride the bus, only certain people take transit? How do we overcome that? Um, there's some concerns about is, you know, we have this in our area, is adding transit going to add to the number of homeless people on our streets? things like that. How do we overcome issues like that? And do European or um, other international cities, do they have that conversation or is it a strictly North American <clears throat> US conversation? Uh, Jill, I've just put in the chat with something which you can pass on to the participants, which is a, a Bloomberg article that I wrote years ago about this question. It's called Why We Should Stop Talking About Bus Stigma. Um, what you find is that where public transit is more useful, there is less stigma around it. 
because where public transit is more useful, more people use it, and the more people use it and the more diverse people use it, the less you hear talk about stigma. So I advise not trying to, not, not really worrying about that problem, but worrying instead about looking at whether your transit system is measurably useful. How much access does it provide? How can you cause it to provide more access? Because the, our communities are full of people who will be happy to use a service if it is useful. And I believe that by and large, the, region, the reason most, Amer most Americans, not necessarily the opinion leaders that you see on Twitter, but most Americans, are, there are plenty of people who are perfectly happy to use a ser service if it is useful and that they are not using the service because it is useless, not because of any stigma associated with it. So um, um, that I think is the key point. Um, it's, it is understandable when we as relatively fortunate people with relatively high standards for personal comfort um, get together, we worry about these things. But um, there are lots of people who have a somewhat broader tolerance and are perfectly happy to use public transit services that are useful to them. Um, this goes to an adjacent point, which is think of that low income customer in particular as a kind of pioneer, you know, someone who uses the service before it's still necessarily nice enough that everyone else might use it. Um, that's how we build transit systems, and that's how you build support for them. That's how you build ridership for them. And it's why I am such an evangelist for incremental improvement rather than the need to, um, you know, erase everything and disrupt transit and make transit something completely different. Excellent. Um, one of the questions I'm seeing also is, um, are there improvements that we could make as urban planners and um, I guess highway designers, uh, people who design transportation infrastructure? Um, how do we, because transit riders, when you get on, before you get on or off the bus, you are a pedestrian or a bicyclist. In some cases, you can put your bike on the bus. Um, how do we make improvements to those types of connections and some people do refer to that as microtransit because we have the scooter revolution that is, has labeled itself as microtransit. Um, how do we make improvements to the general um, built environment to make it more uh, accessible to get to those um, straight line transit offerings? So let me make, let me just, let's pause and make sure we're all using these words the same way. When I use the word microtransit, I mean flexible transit services like little vans. Um, when I use the term micromobility, I mean e-scooters, bicycles, other, other kinds of user-powered services mm -hmm. that expand people's range. Microtransit versus micromobility. Um, fundamentally, the... Um, Everything that you already want to do to make a suburban a, a, a community more walkable is the right thing to do for public transit, particularly if you orient it around bus stops. I think the single biggest battle that we face in suburban contexts in the US is frankly the arterial owned by the with um I'm sorry if the Maryland DOT is in the room, the, uh, the, the arterial owned by the State Department of Transportation, not by the, not by the local government. Um, this arterial that I encounter all over the United States is designed for high-speed traffic, and yet it is also lined with destinations. And it is frequently a street that we have to run on transit on because it is the only straight, continuous street that goes anywhere. And yet it is deeply unsafe to walk on and deeply unsafe to cross. Um, I, and I, I won't completely absolve cities of other streets they may have that look like this, but frequently it is the state DOT's roads that, that have this feature most obviously. Um, I think the most urgent thing that has to be done is engaging with what it means to run that sort of highway through a city where it is lined with development, not a freeway. 
but an, um, a high-speed arterial and how to get those arterials redesigned so that we kill fewer, fewer people on them and so that some kind of basic walkability is possible. One of the ways that could work, I mean, I, I have always beat the drum to have a safe place to cross the street every quarter mile. In some cases, the right spacing may be more like half a mile. But ultimately, when a public transit agency puts bus stops on opposite sides of a road like that at a place where it is not safe to cross the street, um, they're encouraging people to run across the street. And yet, it is the only way to provide service to those places. If an apartment building has been built on one of these um, expressways, nowhere near a safe place to cross the street, what do you expect the transit agency to do? Don't create that situation. And um, and I think we really need to engage with those roads and, and figure out how to fix those problems. And that's going to require um, some compromises from some of the usual standards that the transportation departments have used in designing those roads. Great, thank you. Um, that sort of leads to another question that's um, been posted. What are the benefits of operating or funding transit based on level of government? For example, municipal versus county ownership or regional authorities who manage transit? Excellent question. And this debate is happening in all kinds of places across America where you have big, complicated urban regions and you have some mixture of regional transit agencies, municipal, municipally controlled transit agencies. Um, I, um, I wrote a long essay about this, which I will also give you a link to um, on the whole issue of seamlessness using the example of the Bay Area. But um, the, can, the assumption in the late 20th century, when transit was being rescued and, and made into a government service, the default assumption was that we needed big regional transit agencies that covered an entire urban region. And so that you wouldn't, you know, encounter barriers when you cross the city limits or something like that. Absolutely. Um, but also, there's a problem when you just consolidate a whole bunch of existing municipal operations into a giant regional agency. And that is that municipal transit operations are integrated in a different way because they're integrated with other functions of city government. So I have worked for municipal transit agencies where the problem of eliminating a parking space so a bus can make a turn is a matter of a guy picking up a phone or walking down the, the corridor, three cubicles, to the guy who's responsible for those parking spaces and having a conversation about it, and they solve it. And um, and that's something that in a regional transit agency, then that what tends to happen in the regional transit agency dynamic is they call up the city, the city treats them as just another stakeholder asking for something, and they have a lot more trouble getting responsiveness. So to take an extreme example, um, San Francisco, which has not only a municipally controlled transit authority, but has integrated its transit authority with its parking and traffic authority into a single agency called the San Francisco um, uh, Transportation Authority, um, I would never, ever, ever advise them to give up control of any of that to a larger regional transit agency because they are able to do so much with the integration of transit into other um into other services. I encourage you to follow the debate that's happening now, that's going to be happening very vividly in the San Francisco Bay Area over this. The media has made a big deal out of the fact that, San, that the San Francisco Bay Area has 27 transit agencies. It's an enormous region. Uh, it should have more than one um, because a um, there are different problems with having a transit agency the size of a state um, that is not going to be that is going to seem very far and away, far away and unresponsive to local issues. But fundamentally, I think my feeling about this is the answer is very different in different places. And um, I will give you a link to a, a piece I wrote that'll help you think that through for your own community. Thank you. Um, another theme has to do with congestion. Um, we are trying to attract transit-oriented development in the state of Maryland, and I'm sure that is yeah. happening throughout the country. Um, and there is pushback saying that 
transit-oriented development will create too much auto congestion, which in my mind seems contradictory. And <laughs> um, <laughs> can can you sort of address that issue at all in terms of a have there been studies done to show whether <clears throat> efficient transit with short headways um, actually impacts congestion um and if or if transit oriented development has been studied in that way as well absolutely and it is certainly is true that any development that you make not everybody will come to it on transit and there will be some increment in vehicle traffic um but you have a lot of levers in the design of the development one of those important levers is parking with which you can control both um, the cost of driving and parking at the development, and you can also potentially control the levels of vehicle ownership of residents of the development. It should be absolutely a no-brainer that um, residential development is not bundled with parking in those situations, and that it should be possible to purchase a residential unit without parking attached. Um, that I think there are, I think fundamentally where Todd has um, generated a lot of traffic congestion, it is between some, it has been due to some combination of the transit not being adequate and the Todd itself having too much accommodation for cars built into its design. And that's something that obviously you have to um, modulate very carefully. Uh, because obviously you also need to get the development to pencil out. But this is something that's, I think, changed enormously with the revolution that's happened around minimum parking requirements in this country. The fact that increasingly jurisdictions have stopped requiring parking as an intrinsic part of development. And indeed, if your jurisdiction has not stopped doing that, you need to stop doing that now. Um, we need the market, the development market, to identify the right level of parking and if anything, public policy needs to be pressing down on that level to ensure that we don't make it so easy to drive to places and so easy to own more cars than you need that we do effectively undermine the goals of a transitory development. Great. Um, there's also questions about your thoughts on first and last mile transportation, particularly um, one participant wants to know your thoughts on park and ride lots. Assuming there is a valid practical application, is there any general wisdom on how, how far they should be from um, central cities or even how far they should <coughs> be, um, in some cases, from the transit station itself? Um, again, I have an article on this, which we'll throw in the chat. Um, Here's the thing to remember about park and ride. Um, a good transit service that provides very high access from a location will increase the land value at the station because land value will follow access. Surface parking assumes a low land value because it is a very inefficient use of land. That is fundamentally the problem of park and ride. The problem of park and ride is that from the standpoint of the transit agency, if you're talking about a high quality service like WMATA, you know, Metro Rail, the DC Metro system, um, you are putting so much service into that station that high density development around the station is going to generate far more ridership from you for you than paving a quarter mile radius around the station and making it all surface parking. It's also going to generate much more, much better returns for you than the fantastic expense of structured parking just for parking. Rent. Now, on commuter rail like Mark, it's a little different because the levels of service are so much lower that it's um, that you don't have the same sort of effect on station areas. One of the things you can often do with commuter rail is you have certain stations that are oriented around downtowns and you really encourage downtowns to develop there. But then you have other stations maybe outside of towns where you, where 
there's really nothing else happening and you can just do park and ride. Um, that can work. But in the and and there are also lots and lots of opportunities for what I call small scale opportunistic park and rides. The classic example in uh, has always been church parking lots, um, which are never full. Uh, you know, parking lots of houses of worship, which are never full on weekdays. Um, and many states, um, I know, um, I know Utah did this on a big scale with the Mormon Church, where just you know. It, it, Wherever there was a church parking lot, people knew they could park as commuters, and um, it wasn't a problem, and it got a few more people out out to the service. But the fund, but but um, fundamentally, that's always going to be your problem with park and ride. That at a certain level of development, it's probably the right thing to do, but there's also a level of growth at which it will become the wrong thing to do, and it becomes very very politically difficult to undo it once you've done it. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in I believe in those situations where the operating where the opportunity cost of parking is high because there's an expensive parking structure, or just because you know surface land is taking up is 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 taking up land that could turn into development. Uh, I think it's entirely appropriate for transit agencies to charge for park and ride. I don't think it should be free, because when it is free, that's essentially a subsidy of drivers by non-drivers, of course, because everyone else's fares ends up subsidizing that. So those are some of the thoughts on that. Great, thank you. Um, why do municipalities, states, and the federal government seem to support subways and light rail over express buses and bus rapid transit, or in some cases, um, put a lot of emphasis and excitement behind intracity high-speed rail rather than serving local communities inside that community? Oh, that's a huge cultural question. <clears throat> and I touched on a bit of it in my presentation talking about, about how we have tended to think about rail. Um, rail can be the solution to an access problem. The particular genius of rail is capacity, the high number of customers per employee. And because operating cost is, tends to be dominated by labor, that can be a good deal. That is the uh, that is the case for uh, the kinds of rail services that you have in the D.C. region and more generally around Maryland. But there are also lots of places where rail has been built in order to uh, simply out of emotional attachment to the technology or, as you mentioned, in order to see modern or current or exciting. When and that's why I keep wanting to bring the conversation back to access. Are you sure you're providing access here? the way you're doing this, or are you spending a lot of money on something else? And if so, what is that other thing you're getting? And is it worth all of the loss of access? In case of high-speed rail, um, I, uh, which, which I want to say right away is more tangential to my expertise. I'm more an expert in urban transit planning. But what I'm experiencing as I see high-speed rail is enormous amount of excitement around what are probably multi-hundred billion dollar projects and insufficient excitement around a whole bunch of really good million dollar projects. Um, and there is so much that can be done. Again, it's, it's, it's like the same thing I, I was saying. Incremental improvement can get you all kinds of wonderful places and can get you there in your lifetime, can get you there in the next few years. Um, and I, while I'm not as necessarily against the hundred billion dollar um, kinds of massive, entirely new alignment high-speed rail projects. Um, I really think it's important to be insisting on putting equal amounts of energy and attention into all of the little ways that you can Im incrementally improve um, uh, the services we have. Uh, the the tunnel and curve in Maryland on the Northeast Corridor that we're all hearing about and that's finally being straightened out. A hundred, you know, there are hundreds of those little projects all over the place, and some of them are big projects. You know, the new tunnel under the Hudson into New York that's a big project, but that is, but that's, uh, but but, and yet it's so cost effective because it's about making the most of all this infrastructure we already have and letting us use it more. So uh, I think I think I think we need the full spectrum. And um, whenever a politician tells me about high-speed rail, I, I talk back to them about 
medium speed rail and all the other things that we need to be doing that actually have a chance of happening soon. Right. That's a really good point. As someone who likes <laughs> to take the train to New York from Baltimore, um, yeah. but has to drive to the train station in order to get on Amtrak. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a very a valid, valid point. Um, another theme that I've seen a few questions about, um, can you share any thoughts about the future of technology and transportation, particularly as it relates to automated vehicles, both automated cars and the potential for automated um, transit vehicles? Um, there is already fully automated rail transit. Um, you may have actually ridden them in airports. Mm -hmm. um, rail transit that is fully grade separated, that does not interact with other traffic in any way, is, um, um, is already a known technology. Um, Europe is very, very aggressively, um, uh, many European cities are aggressively converting their fully separated subway lines to automated operation. The key math underlying that is that operating cost is mostly labor. And when you break that need to have an, a paid employee on every vehicle, it is suddenly possible to run a lot more service. Vancouver in Canada, which is a city you really should visit if you haven't, it's a beautiful city, especially in the summer, um, is uh, is really the leader on this in North America. They've been running a driverless rapid transit system since 1986, so coming up on 40 years old, um, and it works very well. Um, extending that technology to vehicles that are in traffic is, of course, part of the whole driverless, uh, you know, the whole much more complicated driverless technology problem that lots of companies are working on. I think we've been through now several hype cycles about driverless cars, and I think it's becoming obvious that the problem is considerably harder than um, first appeared. Um, if that is if that problem is ever definitively solved to the point that our cities are flooded with driverless taxis, then we will have to evolve driverless fixed route transit because there will be no other way for public transit to compete with that. And um, if um, and if we ended up with ridiculously cheap driverless taxis, we would be effectively taking people out of big vehicles, putting them into smaller vehicles, and that would produce gridlock. Mm -hmm. That would make traffic worse. Um, please remember that what Uber and Lyft already do for our cities is that they replace parking demand with traffic. Because every time you leave your car at home and take Uber, that's a parking space at your destination that isn't needed. That's nice. But that's also an Uber car that is going to drive empty from the end of your trip to the beginning of the next person's trip. And that is all new traffic. Right. So that's why there are a lot of nightmare scenarios about universal, highly, um, highly affordable driverless taxis. And if that, if that future were to come about, we would need to figure out how to get, how to, how to tax those things back up to a point where they did not become so abundant that our cities just choked on them mm -hmm. and correspondingly made public transit the viable option. Right. You've talked a lot throughout the presentation and the question and answer period about understanding the goals of transit. And hopefully we've all come away with the idea that the <laughs> primary goal should be ridership and ease of ridership. Um, but Goals can be challenging topics for agencies. Um, someone asks, they can be focused on a few narrow goals um, and assume some basic ones are assumed or known. How do you typically approach or get to a good conversation around goals um, within communities and the decision-making process around transit? That's a great question. It's a big question. And there are some... Um, 
There's some material in the book on that in the chapter on network design in particular, where I talk through in some detail how we work this through. Basically, the steps are, first of all, listen to everybody's goals. You'll quickly discover that there are more goals than you thought and that people actually do have multiple goals. Um, and then, But then what we do is organize the goals in terms of what kind of network would it take to meet each of these goals so that it becomes clear that some of these goals are in alignment, which is to say the same network will deliver on all of them, but other goals are in conflict. And which is to say that to implement this network would give you, uh, to implement this goal just requires an opposite kind of network from to implement that goal. We tend to end up gathering these around something like the ridership coverage trade-off because that's really the, the way that I have found to organize a lot of people's goals so that they see what's at stake. If you are, if you want VMT reduction, if you want public transit to be an alternative to driving so that there's less traffic, you need to want ridership because public transit does that to the extent that people are riding it. If you want fare box revenue, if you want lower subsidies, you need to want ridership. Uh, if you want environmental benefits of transit, you need to want ridership. If you want um, uh, support for denser urban development, you need to want ridership because ridership-oriented planning uh, focuses on places like that. But if you want to say, leave nobody behind, if you want to say, access for all, and it's very hard for a politician not to say those words, then you want the opposite, which is coverage. Now you're saying we're going to go everywhere, no matter whether there's ridership or not. And as I showed you with those drawings I showed you in my presentation, it really, it really, um, the ridership potential of an area is overwhelmingly determined by the geometric facts about how that area is laid out. Density, walkability, compactness, and linearity. That's going to tell us whether an area is a good investment if ridership is the goal. And if ridership is the goal, we wouldn't go to those places. And if we do go to those places, we're going there for a different reason, which is what I call coverage. Now, I am not ever saying, and I am often misunderstood saying this, I am not saying that ridership should be your goal. What I'm saying is you need to think about this. And when we do network plans, we usually take people through the trade-off, and we take um, uh, ultimately transit agency leaders and boards through the trade-off. We ask them a question like, how much of your budget do you want to spend on non-ridership service, knowing that ridership is not a reasonable outcome? Um, absolutely, perfectly good question to ask. Nothing wrong with asking that question. And um, um, And that question, if we can get an answer to it in the form of um, if we can get an answer to that question in the form of percentages, then is something we can implement. So I'm going to put an, exa uh, uh, an example also in the chat of the um, of how that actually worked in a network redesign that we did, which was for the um, Santa Clara uh, Santa Clara County, the San Jose area of California. Great, thank you. Um, Communication is a key component of, you know, getting messages out and um, planning for the future. Um, someone is asking, is marketing and advertising a part of attracting um, choice riders? And do you have any suggestions for where or how to do this? I think that the whole appearance of a system conveying that this is a dignified and civilized form of transportation is fundamental. I, for reasons I explained earlier, um, I do not agree that um, focusing on a so-called choice rider is necessarily going to do that much for you, as opposed to simply making visible the usefulness of your service for all of the potential riders out there, whether or not they fit into a demographic category that you think of as choice. So the effective transit marketing that I'm seeing is not super targeted. It's 
consistent with, first of all, a commitment to make the whole transit experience as civilized as you can, given all the limitations about transit agencies' control of lack of control of infrastructure and everything else. Um, and then it's just it's it's just a very broad message aimed at what again what I would call the middle eighty to ninety percent of the population, um, recognizing that people have all kinds of good reasons to not drive, and all kinds of things uh, of reasons that are motivating them to look for alternatives to driving, and um, and that's why I also believe, for example, that clear information is the best marketing. You know, you use your signage to make to make it really clear and obvious what the bus does, so that everyone notices that. Every you know, um, draw really clear maps highlighting your frequent network. Make sure the frequent network is visible on your mapping. Um, I can make a plug. We do we do network maps. We're happy to draw your network map for you if you'd like. Um, but the important thing is that they be designed in that kind of style. So there are all the there's so much that can be done just to make the system clear and legible and civilized. And um, and if people can see it and they can see how to explore it, and now with all the great new apps that we have that people can use to explore transit systems, people if it's useful, people will use it. Yeah, I think that's a good point because the design of the app that tells you exactly where your bus is on the system and when it will get to you <laughs> is equally as important as the sign that's on the bus stop at the street level. Um, so we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, I have a question that's kind of a process question for how you work. Um, what is the largest municipality you've helped reorganize and how long of a process was, is it generally? What has been the catalyst for that municipality to want to change its existing system? Um, the catalyst is different in different places, but usual, um, in many cases in the United States, um, it has been the, um, anyway, there, there, there have been many different catalysts. Uh, um, sometimes it is a recognition that an, a past approach of thinking entirely about rail as the prestigious thing we're doing is leaving too many people behind. Um, that's been the case in some cities where there's just sense that the rail first agenda had sort of hit a wall. The voters weren't supporting it. They needed to, they needed to, fo and, or just, they needed to focus more broadly. Equity broadly understood has increased the degree of focus on total transit networks, as opposed to the sort of prestigious spine services, the rail services or whatever, because people with equity needs are everywhere. And we have a large issue in the United States of the so-called suburbanization of poverty, which has caused more and more low-income and minority people to end up living in places where it is very diff difficult for transit to get to them, um, but also where legacy transit networks weren't serving them. Sometimes, as in Dublin, Ireland, for example, in the work we've done around Ireland for the National Transport Authority of Ireland, it is tied directly to national climate change policy and national policy about um, uh, uh, which would be corresponding to correspond to state policy in the United States. Ireland's about the size of a state. Um, it, it has been very specific directive state policy about wanting to achieve certain climate targets, wanting to achieve certain sustainability targets in sustainable urban form, and um, a whole of government focus on that for which a reform of the bus network was one reason. So it's been a variety of reasons. How long do these projects take? In a big urban area, the technical work takes less than a year, but the public conversation takes as long as it takes. And usually the whole process is two to three years. Um, but, and of course it depends enormously on how the public conversation goes. These projects go through a rhythm where we do some technical work get to the point, have some alternatives to present to the public, go to the public, have a public conversation, which takes a couple of months. Then we go back to work, digest the public feedback, do some more work, go back to the public. Three, two, three, four cycles of that sometimes. Um, but ultimately, you know, to get to something that is ready for implementation, most of these projects end up in, in big, in big complicated cities taking two or three years. Mm 
Thank you. Um, we have a little bit of time left, so I wanted to give you a chance to give us any last thoughts or remarks, um, things that you were hoping to get asked about that you weren't asked about. Um, and I, I often like to ask the speakers um, to close with how they're feeling about the future of the work and how they stay motivated and positive. Oh, that's a good question. Look, um, people, when they ask me, you know, in my community, should we think about public transit or is there any hope for public transit in my community? Um, I stay positive because my job is to help every community start where they are. And wherever your community is, there is a good next step you can take uh, to make public transit more relevant to, to your community, whether it is for ridership oriented goals like environmental goals or whether it is for coverage goals. If you're a small town of 20,000 people um, uh, out on your own, you're mostly going to have a local coverage kind of need. But there's a, conver there's a conversation to be had about that, and there's a town of 20,000 up on the Canadian prairie that you can go look at that will give you an example of you know, what's been achieved in that context. So um, I stay positive partly because I don't think ever about a binary question of is public transit good, um, uh, going to succeed or not in some abstract sense. Um, that's a nonsense question, if only because there are so many conflicting definitions of success out there. Mm -hmm. But it's also a nonsense question because there is always a next thing you can do wherever you are and um, in whatever kind of community you're in that will give you some sort of benefit. And I see my role always as being to um, help each community um, figure out what it wants and figure out the next step that's appropriate for them in their situation. Great. Thank you. Um, can you give our viewers, um, once again, the information that they need in order to purchase your book? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I will, the book is called Human Transit, Revised Edition. And I think if you remember those four words, you'll find it at your favorite. Um, most bookstore sites will have it. I encourage you to call up your local independent physical bookstore and ask if they're carrying it. That's often a good way to signal to them that they should. Um, but of course, you can also go to your favorite giant online hegemon if that's what you prefer. Human Transit Revised Edition. And there is a discount code. If you there is a discount go code. to Island Press, the code is SMART and you'll get a discount on the book. So that's the that's if you go to islandpress.org. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Again, I appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, thank you, Jarrett, for joining us. This has been a really great conversation. The um, a lot of the feedback within the chat has been good. So thank you very much. I'm just gonna do some.